In this video, I'm going to talk about acid-alkaline balance, how it affects our connective tissue, blood vessels, nerves, brain, digestion, and general well-being. One of the concepts that is discussed in alternative medicine is that of keeping the body alkaline and eating alkaline foods. This is an oversimplification, but there is value to keeping the acid-alkaline levels, also known as the pH, of our bodies in balance. The main way we lose our pH balance is through diet. For the vast evolutionary history of man, we ate an alkaline diet. Looking at the Upper Paleolithic, that is the Stone Age diet of man some 50,000 years ago, it was roughly 87% alkaline forming foods. What does this mean? Foods can have an acidic or alkaline effect on us. As a general rule, all grains and beans other than oats, and lentils and quinoa are acidic, as are all animal products. As a rule, all fruits and vegetables other than spinach, tomatoes, dates, figs, plums, and pomegranate are alkaline, with fats and nuts and seeds being mixed, and starchy tubers being neutral. So our Stone Age ancestors ate about nine parts vegetables and fruits and tubers to one part animal. Our diets are the opposite. Our diets are highly acidic. We eat primarily acidic grains, beans, and animal products. In fact, since most of the meat, poultry, and fish we eat is farm-raised on grains and soy, rather than eating grasses and insects and ocean creatures, these animal products are doubly acidic. Add to this the phosphoric acids in the soda we drink and the highly acidic nature of sugar and even the acidic nature of some supplements and drugs we take such as vitamin C and aspirin, and we end up being extremely acidic. Vitamin C is ascorbic acid. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. You can see this for yourself by testing your saliva and urine with some pH paper, which is available online for about $10. You're looking for a pH paper that will measure from 5.5 to 8.0. Urine pH can be from 6.5 to 6.8 but saliva pH should be right at 6.8. A drop of saliva pH to just 6.6 .6 is a sign not just of metabolic acidosis, but of metabolic syndrome as well. Metabolic syndrome can manifest as insulin resistance, high blood pressure, obesity, high triglycerides, and low HDLs. The urine pH is indicative of how much acid your body is trying to dump whereas the saliva pH is indicative of what your storage of the alkaline element bicarbonate is. Since meat and grains are more concentrated, meaning they have less water content than vegetables and fruits, to get to an alkaline diet, we would need to eat about 90% vegetables and fruits to 10% meat and grain and beans. Since very few of us are willing to eat like a Stone Age hunter-gatherer, and even if we did, it could take years to clean out decades of acids that have built up in the tissues, we need to find another way to manage our pH. I'll tell you what we can do, but first, I will explain the consequences of increasing acidity on the body. Acid is great in our stomach where it kills fungi, viruses, bacteria, and parasites, and helps break down the proteins and activates certain digestive enzymes. Acid is not good outside of our stomachs where it can digest us from the inside out. So to deal with excess acidity, our body has four options. One is that we can urinate the acids out. Our kidneys do this for us all the time, but asking them to deal with more acids than they were designed to handle day in and day out is stressful for them, and one of the reasons why they get weaker with age. A second way that we can remove acids is that we can exhale them out. Acids can be combined with bicarbonate and turned into carbon dioxide, which we can simply exhale. This works well, but is limited by the amount of bicarbonate we have in our bodies, and as a rule, we become more and more bicarbonate deficient as we age. A third way, and this is specific to our digestive tract, our stomachs and liver and pancreas can produce bicarbonate. The stomach uses it to protect itself from the acid it makes. The pancreas and liver make bicarbonate to neutralize the acidic food that comes out of the stomach and activate pancreatic enzymes, which only function well in an alkaline environment. So you can see two of the three ways to neutralize acids, that is through breathing and 
in the digestive tract require bicarbonate. But since our acid intake usually vastly exceeds our levels of bicarbonate, the body must store these acids somewhere, and it chooses the connective tissue as its storage site. Once we become bicarbonate deficient, the following can happen. The acids in the stomach aren't neutralized, so we can get acid burns in the stomach or small intestine. Bicarbonate is needed for mucus to work properly. It causes mucin, what mucus is made from, to swell up with water a thousandfold to become mucus. If a person doesn't have enough bicarbonate, not only won't they digest their food well, but they won't have sufficient mucus in their intestines to protect the intestines from the acids, alkalis, and enzymes, and bacteria. Mucus is also what our microbiome makes its home in, so a bicarbonate deficiency also damages the microbiome. We need an alkaline small intestine to activate pancreatic digestive enzymes. Unless the small intestines are alkaline, the enzymes your body makes won't work for you as well, and you won't be able to digest food properly. So we need bicarbonate for our digestion to work. Since low bicarbonate levels lower digestion, undigested fat, protein, and carbohydrates can enter the large intestine. Proteins and fats in the large intestine can stimulate the growth of putrefying clostridia, the same bacteria that digests the protein and fat in corpses. And protein specifically causes ammonia, which raises stool pH. Lack of properly digested carbohydrates means less prebiotics are available for our microbiome, so it suffers as well. There is an enzyme called intestinal alkaline phosphatase. This enzyme deactivates lipopolysaccharides, which, if you've watched my other videos on the microbiome and gram-negative bacteria, you know cause leaky gut and inflammation. However, as the name suggests, intestinal alkaline phosphatase needs an alkaline environment to operate in. Insufficient at bicarbonate means this key enzyme won't work well, and we can get leaky gut and inflammation. All right, now let's get back to the connective tissue. I said before that the body will store excess acids in the connective tissue. What is connective tissue? Connective tissue is the tissue in between all the cells. However, it is far more than just film material. Connective tissue is a very ancient system. It is older than the nervous system. It predates the hormonal system. The main form of connective tissue is a gel-like matrix that surrounds every cell of the body. No capillary vessel ever touches a cell. Instead, they irrigate the connective tissue, which then feeds the cells. No lymph vessel ever touches a cell. Instead, the cells release their wastes into the connective tissue, which is penetrated by the lymph vessels, which then remove the waste products. No nerve ever touches a cell. Every nerve passes through and ends in the connective tissue. If the nerves are irritated, it is likely that the connective tissue is acidic, and that is what is irritating them. The brain can interpret nerve irritation as anxiety or frustration. We may look around at our external world and think that we are anxious or upset because of things and circumstances in our environment, but sometimes it's just our brain trying to make sense of a general level of nerve inflammation it can't understand. The connective tissue is also home to the white blood cells which patrol it for infections. Acids in the connective tissue cause resident mast cells to degranulate and release histamine, leading to allergies and intolerances. The connective tissue is also penetrated by fiber optic collagen nanotubes, which deliver infrared light from the sun to the cells, a kind of interior cellular illumination system. Connective tissue is also responsible for filtering toxins before they reach our cells, as well as storing fats, proteins, sugars, and water-soluble minerals and vitamins. It does all of these things unless it is asked to store acids instead. So we must decide. Do we want our connective tissue to be doing its job of nurturing and protecting our cells, or do we want it to be a toxic waste site for storage of excess acids we can't get rid of? If we force the connective tissue to be an acid waste dumping ground, the blood vessels will get irritated, the nerves will get irritated, everything will get irritated. Eventually, the connective tissue starts to fail. Initially, we experience this as a weakening of the ligaments, tendons, and bones. These are all types of connective tissue. Tendons and ligaments are always breaking down and reforming. They form by the spinning of connective tissue fibers together into longer strands of very strong material. This is done in the same way that wool is spun into yarn. However, if the connective tissue is acidic, it interferes with this process. Imagine coating sheep wool with grease and then spinning it into yarn. 
pull on the yarn and it'll likely fall apart because the grease kept the fibers from attaching to each other. This is what can happen to tendons and ligaments. If you're over 40 years old, you've probably had the experience of getting injured from doing absolutely nothing. You lean over, you take a step, you turn to the right or left, and then you feel something tear and you've got an injury. How did this happen? You didn't lift up a heavy load. You didn't move past your range of motion. Acids in the connective tissue make for weak tendons and ligaments, and it's likely that one just gave way because it was never properly spun together due to the acids that accumulate in the connective tissue. In addition to weak joints, we can also see this happening in aging skin. Look at the skin of a 90-year-old, transparent, fragile, thin. Skin is connective tissue that you can see, but it's also fragile and thin on the inside of the body too, where you can't see it. One thing that's interesting about wild animals is they don't show the same signs of aging that humans do. I believe this is due in part to their eating of a natural diet which does not acidify their tissue, so their skin and joints simply don't age like ours do. You've probably heard of amyloid plaque in the brains of older people. Amyloid is a type of connective tissue that is binding to toxic proteins, fats, and acids. Would neutralizing dietary acids protect our brains from aging? Would they make it so that we don't have to create toxic amyloid plaque? Possibly. In fact, for every one point drop in bicarbonate on a blood test, we see a four to five month increase in brain age in the elderly. While we're on the topic of the brain, for those concerned with the neurotoxic effects of fluoride on the pineal gland, you may be pleased to know that bicarbonates remove fluoride from the brain as well. So how do we increase our bicarbonate levels other than eating a Stone Age diet? One way is to take a hot bath with two cups of sodium bicarbonate in it. Another name for sodium bicarbonate is baking soda, but make sure you get the aluminum-free form. This, however, can take a while. So another way is by taking sodium bicarbonate orally. However, be careful, there's a right and wrong way to do this. If you just mix some baking soda in water and drink it, it will neutralize your stomach acids, making gas and ruining your digestion. What you want is to deliver bicarbonate to your body the way your body delivers it to you, slowly and at the top of the small intestine. This way, the small intestine will use the bicarbonate to neutralize stomach acids and then activate the pancreatic enzymes and intestinal alkaline phosphatase. Then when that job is done, any excess can be reabsorbed at the bottom of the small intestines into the liver for storage and use again. Once the liver levels are topped off, Bicarbonates can then start working on neutralizing acids in the connective tissue. Once in the connective tissue, bicarbonate can combine with acids to form carbon dioxide, which we can then harmlessly exhale. To this end, I've created Bicarbamet. It is a mix of bicarbonates in a time-release capsule. This way you can eat the way you like, that is, <laughs> overly acid-forming, rather than as a Stone Age hunter-gatherer, and then neutralize those acids before they cause trouble and rebuild your bicarbonate levels. We all have years of acids built up in our tissues that are either causing us problems now or will eventually. Increasing our bicarbonate levels allows these acids to be converted into harmless carbon dioxide that we can simply exhale. Then perhaps we can age like the rest of the animals on this planet. Older, wiser, but still healthy, vibrant, and mentally sharp. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Take care.